today is Thursday. Okay. Okay, so as uh, I mentioned before, welcome back, my friends. Um, this is right now some work that's being created as we speak by, um, uh, with uh, Gurje and myself, um, hopefully soon to be an archive, but it's turning out to be so rich that it means putting the paper together is a little bit of a challenge. And what this amounts to is, how to phrase it, the um, last, this morning, I mentioned those results at the end about the minimal thermodynamic work with um, uh, anything that implements a Turing machine. That's all based upon um, saying what are the uh, rate matrices of a continuous time Markov chain. So in other words, a physical system that's connected to an external bath that actually goes through and computes a Turing machine. So it's got that kind of a model under the hood. And if you were ever to look at, um, some, for example, in that particular case, what's the minimal entry production? You would come up with zero. In a certain sense, you, um, what you have to do is specify many, many things in addition to what a computer scientist defining that Turing machine would specify. But let's think a little bit more about what the computer scientist engineer would actually do and what the thermodynamic consequences of um, what they do um, might be. So actually, wait, I guess I got to do splat out. And does this work? Yes, it does. OK. So this is actually what we are working on. It's mostly been focused on so far deterministic fine automata. And the question is, what is the minimal dissipated work? What is a lower bound on the entry production for a given computational um, system to complete a run and then be reinitialized for the next one? So it's crucial here. We're talking about complete cycles like with the Carnot cycle or the modern solution to Maxwell's demon, things like this. We're looking at the total cost when you get back to starting for the next iteration of your computational system. So the first thing to notice is that in many computational systems, um, think back to, for example, to deterministic fine automata, they actually decompose in a very clean way. In the, ca in the case of a deterministic fine automata, there's the computational machine itself, which is the automaton. And then there's the string of inputs being fed into the machine. The engineer, by and large, is designing the automaton. They're not designing the process that generates the string of inputs. The string of inputs is something that's being entered by a human being, for example. So that means that. We can view the, um, uh, the degrees of freedom, the variables in the computational machine as accessible, and I'll specify what that means um, more precisely in a little bit, whereas the other variables are inaccessible. And that's what I, the distinction between accessible and inaccessible is going to have to do with the amount of work that is required to reinitialize them. So basically, at the end of a run, the engineer is going to reinitialize the DFA and there, the bound on the amount of work that's going to be required is, is going to be given by the fact that these variables are special. The engineer has built the device. They've built all the uh, little logic circuits and so on and so forth of the DFA. So when they reinitialize it for the last run, they can have tried to make that be as thermodynamically efficient as possible. Whereas when the human being generating inputs to the DFA or whatever is generating inputs to the DFA, when they just start on the next string, when they are reinitialized that way, when they sample internally their own probability distribution to produce the next string, that process by which they're doing reinitialization, typically the engineer can't um, access that. They can't actually exploit any kinds of notions of thermodynamic reversibility as far as that is concerned. Um, so therefore, what that means is uh, we can go through the following. What is a lower bound on the work required to reinitialize the accessible variables after a run? Based upon the things that we've been talking about all along up to now, the generalized Landauer's bound, since we're going from the final state, we're reinitializing it, going back to the initial state, this change in entropy is the minimal amount of work required 
that would be required by the engineer to reinitialize the DFA. OK. Then let's look at the, um, oops, that should not have been there. Well, already one typo in these slides. Um, OK. So what about um, when you reinitialize the um, inaccessible degrees of freedom? In the case that they are all actually generated by a human being who is external to the um, uh, engineer, they have no access on it at all, then they can't um, uh, extract any work by reinitializing the degrees of freedom that are inaccessible. But you can imagine there might be other processes where um, other scenarios in which they can actually extract energy by the reinitialization of the inaccessible degrees of freedom. So to actually give meaning to inaccessible, what we are actually saying is the following. When you reinitialize the inaccessible degrees of freedom, you cannot do it thermodynamically reversibly like this. You don't have that kind of fine-grained control of the inaccessible degrees of freedom. Instead, you can almost view this as an ansatz. We're saying that to reinitialize the inaccessible degrees of freedom, the way that you do that is you are just coupling the, the uh, state of those inaccessible variables to a heat bath where they've got a Hamiltonian such that the Boltzmann distribution for that Hamiltonian is actually the initial distribution of the inaccessible degrees of freedom. So you run through the process, you get to the end. So let's say, for example, here is a probability distribution over the inaccessible degrees of freedom, for example, bit strings input to a DFA at time equals 0. We run through the process, and it gets modified to be this. The way we then reinitialize it is we take this particular system, and we couple it to a heat bath such that this right here, that is the Boltzmann distribution for the heat bath. So we take blue, and we, we have on it a Hamiltonian of the heat bath, of, of the inaccessible degrees of freedom, such that when we go through this process of just you um, irreversibly, thermodynamically irreversibly, reinitialize the degrees of freedom, um, the amount of work that you can get back is the amount of work that um, is involved in taking this off equilibrium distribution and letting it equilibrate again. And that's the change in the expected energy of that particular system. OK, so that's our starting point, that the total that on the lower bound on the dissipated work, once we decompose this computational system into an accessible set of degree, uh, variables and an inaccessible ones, it's going to require work of delta s of, of the distribution over the accessible ones to reinitialize the computational machine. The engineer is going to have to burn that. But in general, they might not be able to extract any energy from reinitializing the inaccessible ones. And we're going to be saying that, at best, the amount that they could extract back would be the change of the expected value of this particular Hamiltonian, such that the Boltzmann distribution of that Hamiltonian is the initial distribution over the inaccessible degrees of freedom. OK, so, so let me is, go through uh, that a little bit concretely. Essentially, yep. uh, lower bound on the amount of work that you should do. The amount of work that you will lose and never recover again. Okay. Exactly so, exactly so. Um, and it's obviously a very, very weak lower bound, but nonetheless. So let's consider the case of, um, don't want to go through squeaky. Let's say we have a DFA. It's got some initial state, and you know, it might have some final states. But whatever, it's got its internal states. That's the DFA. It is being fed inputs from some bit string, from some stream of bits, equivalently. In this particular case, 
we're saying this is the system of interest. These are the accessible degrees of freedom. This string of inputs, this input word, is the inaccessible degrees of freedom. So let's say that this input word is um, going to be, what, what symbol do we use? W, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, omega. yeah. So let's say that at each iteration, um, omega, the input word is being generated by sampling, ID sampling some distribution. Before the process starts. Before the process starts. What we do is that this actually defines a Hamiltonian such that e to the negative, the Hamiltonian um, is at distribution. So at the end of the run, the initial distribution of the accessible degrees of freedom, that's a delta function at q0. Typically, you start in your initial state. You could have imagined that there's more than one initial state, and you could have some probability of which one you start with. But in the simplest case, there's one and only one unique initial state of the system of interest of the accessible degrees of freedom. This process goes through. This becomes a distribution over the accessible degrees of freedom. So it starts from a delta function, becomes something else. To reinitialize it, we've got to make it be a delta function again. That requires work. So and the, the amount uh, of work by the uh, was. Sorry, David. So isn't it the dynamics uh, of the system of interest deterministic? Um, we will eventually make them be so. But even though they are deterministic, remember, this is randomly chosen. Yeah, so... So, so that means that this becomes a distribution. So just like the, in, for example, in finite bad formalism, for example, when we partition a system, like I think of this composition as a global system, um, even though we still write down the Hamiltonian for the system that describes the deterministic behavior of the system, the system in general evolves stochastically because of its you know, interaction with the environment. In this case, the, sto the stochasticity is induced by this environment, which is composed of the bit strings. Yep. OK? Exactly. That is the exact um, identity we're going to be making formally. This is identical to the finite bath formalism to the Hamiltonian formalism, I should say, where this is the bath. And it's got a random initial state. This is our system of interest. Because of its interacting with the bath, it actually starts in a delta function distribution, but then becomes something different. And the minimal amount of thermodynamic work to reinitialize it is just that ending entropy minus the beginning entropy, which is 0, because it's a delta function. In contrast, we're saying that because the string of bits coming in is not under the control of the engineer, the probability distribution over W is not in the control of the engineer, we're just assuming that it's free relaxation, thermal relaxation. To reinitialize this, we're saying, you know, in fact, usually the engineer is not going to be able to get anything back. But as a kind of a best case of what they might be able to do, if inaccessible is going to mean anything at all, then we're going to say that the, amount, the maximum amount of work that they could actually get back by thermalizing this is going to be an upper bound on, the, uh, negative, on how much they can actually um, recover when, they, when the whole system gets reinitialized. If they were given the opportunity, you engineer, you're actually allowed to be reinitializing the bath. We're assuming that they would um, be able to extract at most this much work by reinitializing the bath, by letting it just thermalize freely without um, uh, getting anything close to land hours bound. So essentially, reinitialization uh, assumes that you decouple the two systems. You couple the, at the reinitialization, they're actually decoupled. At the reinitialization yeah. step, yeah, we, re, we um, reinitialize the accessible degrees of freedom by semi-static relaxation, and we reinitialize the inaccessible ones just by letting the system re-thermalize by being um, coupled to some external um, uh, You source. switch off the interaction. Exactly. We switch off yeah. the interaction, yes, okay. good point. Yep, in the reinitialization step. Yep, very, very good point. Okay. So, um, yeah, so time is going to be interesting.
So this is a way, now as I was just saying, if you look at this formula here, um, that then um, is for, is that formula for the lower bound on the dissipated work, this is exactly the same formal formula that arises in the um, Hamiltonian approach to just stochastic thermodynamics. But a couple of things to notice. First, here we're paying no attention at all to any dissipated work that actually occurs in running the process forward. In general, there would be dissipated work there as well, but we're only looking at the work um, that's dissipated in the reinitialization process. So as I say, this is a lower bound on the dissipated work. So that's one contrast with the um, standard approach of the uh, Hamiltonian formulation. But notice something else though as well. In the, um, uh, in the Hamiltonian approach, and for that matter, in quantum thermodynamics as well, we say that the initial distribution over um, the state of a system of interest and a state of a bath is P of X times P of Y. It's a product distribution. In the context of stochastic thermodynamics, that's very weird. If I want to be able to say something about the second law or the thermodynamics of the interacting gas molecules in this room or what have you, they're not going to start in a product distribution in general. That's a very, very strange thing. And in fact, if you allow them to be um, coupled arbitrarily, all the results in the Hamiltonian approach break down. Cool as that stuff is, cool as what jo um, Chris Jarzinski did and so on, it depends crucially on this. And that means that, well, yes, I can make an experimental system where we've actually got that independence. But this is not going to be describing things that I find out in the wild, so to speak. In contrast, when we're applying this to computational systems, it is almost um, axiomatic that every run of a computational system, the computational machine itself, its initial state is formed by sampling a distribution. And the actual, in this case, the actual words coming into the DFA are generated by sampling some different distribution, it's statistically independent. So whereas it's a very restrictive assumption in the context of Hamiltonian thermodynamics, here it's actually just built into what happens with actual computers. So the reason that the actually, so the reason, I mean, one of the main reasons that he actually chose this formalism is that if you want to come up with a thermodynamic framework that is applicable to arbitrary computational machines, you need to you know, take care of this aspect that how are computers initialized in computer science? So this is how it goes. So and this is given by the Hamiltonian formulas, actually. Okay. So anyway, so that's a lower bound on the dissipated work. Um, as, as I say, it's the exact same formula as in the Hamiltonian finite bound stochastic thermodynamics. Therefore, we're going to be calling this dissipated work EP even though the entropy production, even though that's not strictly speaking legitimate. Um, there are subtleties involved with this. Um, this is basically, you can see the results of uh, last night. I fell asleep, so I didn't manage to complete these. So Gilj is actually going to be taking over in a moment. But let me um, just point out some subtleties here. Um, one of them is, uh, so I just took care of the first bullet, uh, comparing out this rationale here, and what we call the inclusive thermodynamic formulation of computational systems, comparing it to that in the Hamiltonian stochastic thermodynamics. There are some subtleties, like for example, notice here that um, uh, the, if there's any kind of an input string, input word, that cannot ever occur. There's zero probability of it occurring then the associated value of the Hamiltonian is, has to be infinite to forbid it. That means that to be able to have a well-defined expected energy of that bath Hamiltonian, we must make sure that as the um, system evolves, the whole computational system evolves, we never actually have that bath Hamiltonian with any probability fall into one of the values such that, sorry, that the bath state 
fall into one of the values such that the bath Hamiltonian is infinite. So if there are some bit strings that are initially impossible, we must choose our set of variables carefully so that whatever we are identifying as the bath, which is initially this bit string, it doesn't actually ever with any probability have one of these values where the associated Hamiltonian is infinite. Is what the elaborate your question? I mean, put the string that is out of the language is the only way to do the Hamiltonian of infinity. Oh, um, well, by definition. Yeah. Well, we ah, okay, yeah, okay, 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 yes. okay. Because we are because we are reinitializing the inaccessible degrees of freedom by thermalizing them, and if we want to say that some of these states of the inaccessible degrees of freedom can never ever arise, that means that in the thermalization process the Hamiltonian for that particular state has to be infinite okay. to make sure it's got zero yeah. probability. Okay, okay. So there are these kinds of subtleties. Third and fourth point. Can we jump to the board? Um, yes. Do you want to take over now, actually? That, that would be great, I think. Yeah, okay, like, yeah. I think like on a, I don't know, like a conversational level, let's say, to make yep. it clear, Blackboard is like really It is yours. So, uh, can I... Can I uh, make a comment or say please so essentially if you are the engineer and you want to optimize uh, this uh, machine uh, so what you would like to do is to minimize the um, uh, reinitialization work okay yeah mm -hmm. exactly and so the formula for that is given by this and then there are going to be things like because this is formally identical to the Hamiltonian formalism, we can actually take a lot of the results in that formalism and apply them here to analyze the thermodynamics of arbitrary computational machines, where notice there's no specification here, rate matrices of temperatures. So it can be non-Markovian as well. It's all non-Markovian and so on and so forth. But we can exploit those results. So for example, we've derived an integral fluctuation theorem for the amount, for this lower bound on the dissipated work in computational machines without, and, with, and it's a lower bound, so we're not paying attention to anything that actually goes on in the forward process, only the reinitialization step. Okay? So, um, uh, Gilje will take over for the last part of it, and um, I might scoot up to get a coffee and come back, so, okay. Microphone. Yes, microphone. By the way, I guess that's the end of my lecturing. So mm -hmm. thank you for not throwing tomatoes at me or, uh, any, or balls or anything like that. And um, I hope you at least got some glimmers, um, awkwardly um, presented as they might be, of just why this is just such drop dead cool stuff. Computer science and stuff. Okay, now what we're going to do is to actually prove that there's, there's a relation between um, minimal dissipation that we want to get and the, why am I like, yeah, okay, I'm going to do this. Okay. Choof, choof, okay, yeah, I <laughs> do things like that. Um, yeah, everyone hears me, right? Okay. So, chalk. So just to give some like this this overall landscape, I think, 
say actually physical in a sense. We can argue, but I mean, this means energetic, and this means this is almost like equivalent. Okay, so we talked about, for example, in the previous lecture, a complexity measure, an algorithmic complexity measure, like a Kolmogorov complexity, right? Levin complexity, and so on and so forth. And David actually sort of presented a thermodynamic complexity measure, okay? Where you try to minimize the heat flow. So, and this was for Turing machines, okay? We didn't talk about computational complexity yet. Now we are going to do it. So th there are two major sort of components of computational complexity in computer science theory. One of them goes by the name of descriptive complexity, OK? One of them is the resource complexity. OK, so all this you know, cool stuff with the computational complexity in a sense comes from the resource complexity. OK, computer science, lots of computer scientists are concentrated on this aspect. But to be honest, we don't know. I don't know how to talk about like, computational complexity for any computational physical system that we are modeling. But there are simpler things we can do. For example, when we discuss this hierarchy of computational models, Yesterday, we introduced finite automata and like push down and so on and so forth, and then Turing machines, right? So, our goal is to start discussing computational complexity starting from this part. We're going to be introducing that. And starting from the lowest level of computational machine. Because again, as David also emphasized yesterday, computer science aspects for finite automata and the sort of like this computational complexity aspects of finite automata, we know about them already. It's great. So we have access to this. What we have to do is to come up with a physical model that we can use to describe the relations, potential relations between computational complexity and thermodynamic cost of running a computational machine and thermodynamic complexity. Okay? So finite automata. Let's remember the sort of the definition of a finite automata. It's a five tuple. This is the formal computer science definition that you can come across whenever you like, you know, open a random textbook in computer science. M signifying finite automata, deterministic finite automata. And it's a five tuple. So Q is a set of states, okay? Q0 is the initial start state. We, ex we think that mostly um, there's a unique start state, so you know where you, are start, where you start from, like computing and processing these strings. And rho is the transition function that takes a pair of symbols. This is the alphabet that is defining symbols. For example, this is a binary alphabet that takes a pair of current state of the finite automata and the string, the symbol of the string that the finite automata is processing at one iteration at one time and maps it to an element, again, of the set of states, okay? I'm going to introduce a diagram in a second. It will all be great. And this is the um, set of except states. For now, let's just uh, stick with some, you know, assumption that cardinality is just like one, okay? So the one thing, that, okay, so we, we yesterday introduced two equivalence relations. First, I'm going to start with this so that we can take this abstraction and actually make sense of it, okay? L stands for language, okay? Oh, by the way, no, there is one more definition that I need to give. We define a language that is accepted by an automaton M in the following way. It is a set of strings, okay, that is generated by alphabet 
uh, sigma, this clean style that David introduced. Basically, it's all the strings that you can generate, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, and so on and so forth, okay? So omega string, one string, is an element of it. And you define the language such that it's a composition, it's a set of strings that satisfies this. So if you apply the transition function, and so like you're starting from the start state and you start processing one string, if you end up in one of the accepting state or in your unique accept state of the automaton when you halt, then Yes, this string is in your language. So uh, uh, this is just one step? I mean, row describes one step or the iteration of any step? Oh, yeah, you can do that. That's great, actually. Yeah, okay. so let's do that, actually. The length of the omega, okay? okay? So this is the language. And now we can start actually defining the equivalence relations. We had two equivalence relations. One of them is defined over the language, okay? It's shown by tilde L. So we are taking two strings, a pair of strings, u and v. And we say that these two strings are equivalent to one another if they satisfy the following condition. Okay, take an arbitrary string and concatenation, and if they're like in the both, if they're sort of like in the language, in the same language for all of the strings that you can come up with. So you can remind me of what the K is because oh, I. Oh, the um, it's a set the of accepting states. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna put a diagram in a minute. Okay. 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 Or I can actually do it right now, I think, because it will be, yeah, that's a great point. So let's do it like this one. Okay. This is a finite automaton. Deterministic finite automaton. This is the start state, okay? Um, in this interesting example, this is also the accept state, but we don't care about it. Unique, like the start state and accept states, that might be dif that they might be different. Uh, I think like this, like this, yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is a finite automaton, and k over there, it includes q zero. If you want to write down Q, you list all the states. Okay, alphabet is the binary alphabet. And transition function is, for example, in this case, you can write it as a table. Okay, that makes sense, right? Perfect. So, equivalence relation. So, we gave the first definition of an equivalence relation. But we also said yesterday that, well, we want to, when we run the computational machine, such as a DFA, we want to be able to distinguish these strings if they are not equivalent to one another. So we are also defining another equivalence relation over the DFAs, okay? Tilde M. So we say that, oopsie, if you take two strings, they are equivalent to one another over the DFA with respect to the DFA if they satisfy the following condition. So we start from the start state. We start processing these strings that are given to us. These are different strings, okay? They, come, they can come in different lengths. We don't care about it. So, and when we actually sort of like and processing these strings so that we read all of the string, we consume it. If we end up in the same state after reading both of them, we say that they are um, equivalent to one another, one another over the DFA. Like for example, over here, one one is actually, for example, you read this one, you read this one, you come back to Q zero. It's equivalent over the DFA to just like reading string zero. Okay? So now, Let's 
draw something else. So believe me, just that this, this is an automaton that recognizes the following language, OK? Let's say that L, I don't know, L3, I guess. OK? This is a language. And this is the DFA that recognizes this language, let's say M. Now, we are, so I'm going to first of all say something. If you remember from yesterday, we talked about things like my Hill neural theorems and so on and so forth. We say that there is going to be this unique DFA that recognizes this language with a minimal number of states. And we can talk about these things because we know that there is an infinite number of finite automatons that, that can recognize this language L. So I'm going to draw, for example, one of them. Okay, so this is, let's call this M prime, okay? This is also an automaton that recognizes the strings, the bits divisible by three, okay? For example, I mean, yeah, just like, and, and these are these two automata are equivalent to one, uh, one another. You can just see it, for example, read one, zero, one, one, zero, one. You come here, you accept it, one, zero, one, zero, one, one. Zero, one. Yeah, okay. It's, it's true, right? One, one, zero. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. If there is a problem, then I can't think of it, but I guess that's okay. But anyways, so yes. So one way to see that these automata are equivalent to one another is actually sort of ask about this question of, okay, the only difference of this M prime from this M that we just sketched here is that you are introducing a new state, right? So let's ask the question of basically, okay, I'm gonna do my best. So let's just ask the question of basically, okay, does this, does this Q3 state that we just introduced, does it do something different than what Q2 does here? For example, Q2 reads one, it goes back to itself, it, goes, it reads zero, it goes to Q1, okay? So if you just follow the steps, you will basically see that Q3 acts exactly in the same way as the Q2 does. So it's basically a larger finite automaton that recognizes the same language, but it has larger number of states, okay? So one thing that is really important to us, in, to us, I, I just became a computer scientist, to computer scientists is that when you are, for example, running a DFA, in the physical sense in your computers, and you want to, for example, you have terabytes of data that you want to like sequence and try to find regular patterns in. For example, biological sequence, like what you have is instead like this alphabet and you're trying to find this regular patterns. What you do is to construct like DFAs and let them process the strings, okay? So if you introduce more states, then it will take long, longer time to run this and sort of like come up with results and so on and so forth. So this is something that you do not want to do for simple efficiency reasons, okay? So for that matter, people came up with this, at least for this finite automata, this measure of size complexity. This is a screen. It's even better, thank you, so that I won't see myself while walking around, so this is Okay, so, okay, yeah, yeah. Can I continue? I mean. So how much longer do you folks want to go? I can be done in 15, 12 to 15, if it's okay with you. Is that okay with everybody? You hold the proverbial whip hand. Okay. So I'll um, go up and start the meeting, okay. Sebastian. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so we are continuing. So like, I promise you that the end result will be like really sweet, so we can continue with this. 
So yes, again, what we want to do is to be as efficient as possible. So we want to come up with this you know, minimal DFAs to perform our computation. So computer scientists in like 60s and 70s, they came up with this baby measure of complexity. So when I wrote this like sort of like sketch, this you know, the big picture, we talked about two different kinds of computational complexity. One of them is the cool one, resource complexity, and the other one is descriptive complexity, okay? So size complexity is a form of what is called a descriptive complexity, and it is basically given by this. So the size complexity of a DFA, of any DFA that you have, is basically given by the number of the states of the DFA, okay? And the size complexity of a language, of a or language that is accepted by a set of like infinite actually, you know, infinite set of DFAs is given by the number of states in the minimal DFA. So now, I can just quickly prove that this is a minimal DFA that actually recognizes this language and we're gonna do this in the following way. Okay, I'm giving you a set of like these strings that you can form by just considering the binary alphabet 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, and so on and so forth. So if I sort of like put you put there this constraint of, okay, I'm defining a language and I want to identify the strings that are acceptable, uh, divided, div divisible by three bit strings. So I know that there can be only three classes of strings because if you give me a bit string and I try to divide it by three, Either it's gonna be divisible by three, remainder zero, or it's gonna have remainder one, or it's gonna have remainder two. Modular arithmetic, right? So you can basically partition this set of strings into three classes, which is basically, let's say, mm, I'm just gonna say remainder one, or sorry, remainder zero, remainder one, and remainder two, okay? So, this basically suggests that if you want to recognize a language by, a, by any kind of a machine, like a DFA, you need to at least have three states to identify it, right? How many states does it have? Three. So, this is the best you can do. So, let's go back to this equivalence relations that we defined. We defined an equivalence relation over a language, right? This tilde L which is highly abstract. It's not really easy to actually sort of visualize it. But we also defined this equivalence relation over the machine, the automata that recognizes that language. And one thing that we can realize is that, oh geez, okay, good, okay. So one thing that we can realize is that sometimes when you have an equivalence relation over a DFA, if for example, this is a minimal DFA, this equivalence relation over the machine is coinciding with the equivalence relation over the language, okay? But sometimes it doesn't. For example, if you don't have a minimal DFA, it will not in the following way. So now I'm going to, okay, so we say that, for example, this is one class of strings that are divisible by three. This is the remainder one, remainder two. If we go back to this DFA, what we see is that we can actually relabel these classes by basically the states of the DFA. For example, in our case, this is the equivalence class, the state basically symbolizes the equivalence class, Q0, divisible by three, Q1, remainder one, and Q2, remainder two. Okay, so there's a like a one-to-one -one relationship uh, between the equivalence relation L and M. But in this case, we just actually discussed that Q3 doesn't do anything different than Q2. So if you want to describe this equivalence relation, lambda m prime, what we do in a schematic way is to take it here, for example, okay? So we are actually sort of getting a finer partitioning of the set of all states, okay? Now I'm going to use a different one. But, so I'm using blue for the equivalence relation over the language, which is basically identical to equivalence relation of M, minimal, okay? 
But if you come up with something like an equivalence relation that is defined with respect to a non-minimal automaton, you will always get a finer equivalence relation. What you're doing is like you're basically splitting this equivalence classes, partitions, into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. You're always getting finer. And as a, I don't know, I think as a cute point, you cannot ever get a coarser relationship. Otherwise, the automata that you construct would not be able to recognize that language. So now, building on that, this kind of equivalence relations, we are almost there. OK, I'm going to keep it here, and I'm going to go like this. So we discussed equivalence relations interchangeably in set theory, like basic set theory. We say that equivalence relations over a set, in this case, set of all strings, or the set of this language that we define, they define partitions over the set, OK? This is like OK, set partition. That's what we call partition is basically if you partition a set, um, you're basically grouping the elements of that set into pairwise distinct non-empty subsets. OK, so one thing that we are going to introduce is what we call to be a partition refinement. So this is a definition, OK? OK. So let me give you two different partitions of that set. One of them will co uh, com basically correspond to the partition that constructs this machine M, minimal one, and one of them will correspond to the non-minimal M prime, OK? OK, so this is one partition. This is another partition, OK? If you want to actually write it in terms of this M prime, you can you know, take basically this Q3 inside of this guy here. But they, because like they, they just belong to the same equivalence class, because these guys are identical, so nothing is going to change. Okay, so these things are called blocks. This is a block. This is a block. This is another block. Okay, so partitions are composed of blocks, and we define the partition refinement of any two partition in the following way. We say that, for example, in this case. This is like this one. We read this in the following way. M prime refines M. If you can construct M prime by splitting the blocks of M into pieces, just as we did here. So in like the informal sense, you know, the mathematical definition of what you're doing, this operation here, is a partition refinement. Okay? So one thing that is interesting about this relationship is that it defines what we call to be a partial order over the set. Or again, when I say set, just think about set of the strings and how we partition them, OK? Partial order. It is basically a binary relation that is anti-symmetric, this is the difference, and preserves reflexivity, and blah, 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 and then um, transitivity. We have this condition because we know that if M prime is refining M, M cannot refine M prime, so it's anti-symmetric. So probably four minutes or something like that. So we got these schemes in our head, right? So we know what is a minimal automaton, non-minimal automaton, and how we refine them. OK, this automaton refines this automaton. And basically, every non-minimal automaton refines the minimal automaton, OK?
So let's now consider the set of all automaton that actually recognizes this language L. It's going to include elements, like infinite, actually, in, yeah, I mean, elements. Like, I don't know, m prime, bop, 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 bop. And we know that there is a unique element inside this set, which we call to be the minimal DFA. OK? So now, last mathematical operation that, OK, penultimate, and there is another uh, mathematical operation that we are going to consider is that when you have a partial order over a set, this is called something that you actually know that we saw. It's a lattice. OK? So it's a lattice of what, right? It's a lattice of this partitions that is ordered by the partition refinement. Now, what I say, it's going to be, become really clear. Let's start from, you know, like this lattice structure that we have is like, for example, you have this point, and then you sort of like go like this, like this, like this, and sort of like you have this kind of like a tree-like structure, right? So this is something that we, actually, we are sort of familiar with, even if not in formal terms. So let's start with this one. What we are going to do is to cons construct a lattice of automaton over this set, okay? So for example, it's essentially infinite, but we can, I mean, I'm not going to go into mathematics, but we can sort of like, again, partition, partition, partition it and have a an finite one. So, so in our case, we start with this guy over here. This is the minimal automaton. Think about it as the, you know, the root of the lattice. And when we have non-minimal automaton, we base, what we do is basically refine this minimal automaton. Okay, for example, in this m prime one, introducing a state that is equivalent to another state. For example, q3 acts in the same way as q2, but I could add another state that would act equivalently to q1 or q0 and so on and so forth. So basically, one of the m primes can look like that. But there will be another, like q1, q1 prime that you can like distinguish and there will be Q2, and so on and so forth. So as you go, like as you take this road upstairs, you are increasing your size complexity. As you go down to the, this root of the lattice, what you're having is basically you're minimizing your size complexity. And this is what we're using, and just a simple proof of showing that if you minimize the size complexity, one last mathematical operation, if you minimize the size complexity, you're gonna minimize dissipation. Now, final mathematical operation that I just, I just kept talking about is that on this, let this is a mathematical structure where you can introduce some really interesting mathematical operations. And one of them is what we call to be the join. Okay? And it is defined in the following way. Let's say... I'm going to use alpha and beta, OK? And it is composed of these blocks that we just considered. This is a block. This is a block, OK? Um, and the join is a, an operation that is shown like this in general, where basically you are taking intersections over all the blocks that define these different partitions, OK? Um, where, yeah, basically. I, J, natural numbers, OK? So one thing that is interesting about this operator is that let's now think about, you know, just instead of considering random alpha and beta, Think about this minimal automaton partition at the root and a non-minimal one that corresponds to this kind of different partition and take the join of them. Because of the fact that we just pronounced, basically, you can 
construct M prime by splitting M. If you take this intersection operators, you will get the, as the result of this joint, oper joint operation, joint operation M prime itself. So if I give you a minimal automaton and a non-minimal automaton as their, and their partition constructions, and if I apply the joint operation, what we have is the non-minimal -automaton, uh, non automaton itself. I think, okay, now final step. So let's remember that we wanted to talk about thermodynamic cost, right? So we are going to do it now. Again, what we wanted to understand was the following one. This is the formula that David used. So this is basically the, so you have a system, okay? And you decompose it into basically uh, a computational machine and an environment. So now what we are doing is, coming back to this finite bad formalism of stochastic thermodynamics, you have this sort of like this idealized universe, okay? And you split it into two, which is the computational machine and the environment that actually generates or feeds the input strings like one, zero, blah, 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 okay? So, <clears throat> now one of the things that we can do is that we can define the universe as like the triples of these, um, or, the, or the, let me not go into triples, but basically just the pair of like the state that considers the state of the evolution of the DFA. This is just like, um, let me use Q here. And also the strings that are generated by the environment. And your system, your universe evolves as the, this changes basically, or yeah, as you iterate something, as you process these strings, or as you, buy, and, and you update the DFA correspondingly, okay? So this is like just, a, we are not gonna be using it here, but what we do in terms of partitions is that you sort of also partition it by writing the entire phase space over these pairs as a, like a Cartesian product over these two. The elements go here, are the state of the DFA, the elements that go here are the strings generated by the environment, okay? So this is another one. So this is how you can actually ask the question of, okay, my computational machine is the SOI, okay? And this, this delta S that I'm computing for is the entropy, um, entropy production over this SOI so that I generate this, I, I have this entropy production as I process the strings over the DFA, and this is the heat flow okay, in the environment. So, one thing that we are gonna do is to take this result and the, and the fact that we can actually locate this automata on a lattice that is defined by a partial order over the set of the strings that are accepted by this automata and just see what happens to the change in the entropy. So one crucial thing that we do here is that we emphasize that from a computer science perspective, the state of the automata and the state of the system, it's actually a direct delta distribution because it's initialized to one state and it's, it just starts evolving from that one state, right? So if you actually want to compute delta S, uh -oh, which is like S the, the difference between the final, uh, final time entropy and the initial time entropy, well, the entropy over direct delta distribution, there is no uncertainty, it's zero. So what you're gonna compute is basically the final time entropy. One thing that is crucial about this lattice is that, um, we will show it, uh, we, we put it in the paper, we, we don't have to talk about it right now, is that this lattice doesn't change as you process the strings, okay? So this is important. So whatever the time that you're checking, the result that we are gonna prove now, just by one step, it's going to be holding for all probability distributions at all iterations, independent of the dynamics and everything. So, now, we defined this, this joint operation and this is the key to our proof. One proposition that is actually proved by Arnold, like, just like, I don't know, in ergodic theory in the 60s, and the theorem, okay? We start with the proposition. He suggests that, and he proves that, the entropy, let's say S, 
over a refined partition is always larger than the entropy over the partition that is not split into two, that is not refined. Let's show that very quickly. Turns out, this is basically the joint entropy, okay? Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Thank you. So this is basically joint entropy. You can check it. Arnold has an ergo dictionary book. I don't know what it's like, what it's called, but something. I don't know. We just Google Arnold ergo dictionary. Um, so you can write this as this one. Now what we're going to do is take this one insert this one, okay? Because we know that the join of two is these two partitions where you have one refined partition of another partition is basically given by the refined partition. So this is basically this. Left hand side is SM prime. This is non-zero, conditional entropy. That's it, okay? So one thing that we know is that delta S that is given by this, it's always greater. It's always minimal for the minimal automaton. And we know this because also like there is a unique minimal automaton. It's at the, like this, sitting at this root of the lattice and so on and so forth. So one thing that you want to do is if you want to minimize the change in the entropy, you minimize the system. So, but what we're actually asking for is to minimize the entropy of production, right? Um, how to, should, I, should I go into that? Um, OK, I can go into that just like, um, OK, one minute. We're going to jump a lot, but it's going to be there. So this is the change in the expected entropy of the bat, right? So when you run two, like, I don't know, some many equivalent DFAs, and one of them is the minimal DFA and the rest of the non-minimal DFA, what you do is to let them process these strings that are generated by the very same environment, right? So this term is essentially, I mean, there are also other formal arguments, but this term is essentially uh, the same for every automaton, for the minimal automaton, for the non-minimal automaton, so you don't care about it, okay? So if you have this, Then you have this, and sorry, this is E, I, or yeah, that, this is right. So if, when, because we have this, we can also write this. This is prime. And this is that. So this is, and you, then of course, you, there are like one of the things that we didn't discuss is that if you have a different computational machine, the way that you can decompose this universe, it changes, okay? You can introduce pointers, you can make architecture as complex as possible, but basically what you can have is always recreate this kind of a, um, this kind of a picture where you basically suggest that entropy is a partial order over the set of automata, equivalent automata. And so one other question is that, so this is a result that holds for all distributions at all iterations, independent of how you run the automata and so on and so forth. And another result can be derived by considering like if, we, if I give you like two different automata, none of them are minimal, you know that, how do you compare the automata? Then you start to ask this question of like, for example, Matteo raised by basically suggesting that, you know, you need to know something about the way that like the dynamics, underlying dynamics or the probability distributions and so on and so forth. And if you read the paper, you will see that by just assuming like this set of the, like really mild, I think like this, I don't know, fairly sensible assumptions, there is also different, like a very gentle ways of comp um, comparing the dissipation costs of any automaton that recognizes a language. So this is something cute. Okay, so, and this is the, I think, first step towards actually talking about this computational complexity and thermodynamics, 
building on the algorithmic complexity work that David introduced. And from that on, I think there can be like, yeah, some really marvelous blended landscapes that we might see. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, are there questions? So, well, okay. So then uh, I think we thank you very much for uh, this uh, last um, uh, lecture. And, uh, and then uh, we, well, we meet again uh, at 4 for the next lecture and, uh, and tomorrow for the, for the exam. Okay.